so as I was saying, Janet is, um, we were just talking about how authentic she is. And, and even with all her resume and, and all these incredible things, the things she's authored, all of that, um, it's the authenticity that really came through, um, the deep experience uh, that she has, has as a coach and just as a human. Even when I was talking to her the last time, it was just such a great experience for me. And I think for all of those of us who were on that last call, I, I'm believing that the, it will be the same today. Mm -hmm. So as we welcome Janet Harvey, uh, she will be sharing with us the title, Courageously Disrupt, Evoke Awareness That Heals and Emboldens. And so Janet, welcome. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for the entire ICF Orange County Board and, of course, all of the chapter members. You know, we're just better together, and it's challenging to be in a, a practice, a professional practice, where our clients uh, haven't experienced anything like it before. And so how do you know? How do you know if you're doing well? Well, it's our peer relationships and time we spend together this way, co-learning and reflecting to each other that helps us to remember, oh, that's why I love my work and I'm on the right track. And maybe sometimes I'm not on the right track and I have a colleague who will understand that and be in support of me. And uh, my comments are a little bit prescient for what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to read the article. It was a really important one for me to write. Yes, Courageously Disrupt. If you haven't read it, it's no problem. Uh, you'll have access to it to read it later. But it came out of a time when I felt really strongly that we as practitioners have a very important role in the world today. Uh, we were joking about this a little bit, but the, the um, subtitle to the book I wrote in 2020 was The Year of No Return. And I, I had a publisher in New York, not a publisher, a, um, what are they called? A public relations person um, said to me, what the heck does that mean anyway? <laughs> and I thought to myself, yeah, that's the problem. We're so attached to a certain way of going in our lives. We find preferences and habits and biases that, that help us feel safe and comfortable, but the world never stops changing around us. And we can get more and more attached to those habits and preferences unconsciously. So the minute when we do wake up, boy, does it feel jarring. And that's what COVID did. It jarred us all awake in a way that we never anticipated. And unless we can ourselves as coaches first, and then with our clients, uh, recognize that disruption is normal, it's happening all the time, and we have way more capacity to meet it than we think we do, um, we'll, we'll experience this in and out, this um, feeling of kind of getting jarred awake and then going, no, 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 I want to go back to what's safe and comfortable. So I wrote this article, and, I, and I've been um, exploring a lot of what I'm going to share with you tonight with coaches to help them appreciate how equipped you are and the ways, some ways in which you can recognize how to attend to your own well being. And all of the things that I'll talk about for you uh, are extendable to your clients. I, I will tell you that some of what I say tonight is likely to challenge some of your experiences and preferences. Um, and keep breathing and keep using chat. Let me know as we go along where there are comments or questions that arise for you or something that, that somehow doesn't feel like it lines up with the experience that you've been having. Let's be exploring that because a lot of what we're talking about is a, what I call the creative destruction cycle. Yeah, I studied economics, so um, I kind of have that in my head as a, as a frame of reference. But just like nature is in a natural cycle, um, we often think of disruption maybe as an unwelcome intruder. And yet, if we can flip that and see disruption as the indicator that something new and emergent is available to us, if we can soften our grip on what we are used to having. When we recognize that that's a cycle, it's a lot easier to help people face what feels insurmountable 
remembering that uh, everything we've learned in life, we learned by falling down and getting back up again. You know, I, I think a lot of the pain that people are feeling, um, whether they had COVID or they lost a loved one to COVID or they've been on the front lines in their organization um, in almost every sector, trying to figure out how to find our way out through to the other side. In a lot of ways, um, we're, not, we're not being transformed through the traditional methods of healing trauma. Uh, often what we're doing is transmitting the trauma to another. Let's watch the news. And we see the kind of the head spinning disruption that's going on and it's hard to make sense of it. And yet um, the, the real key is to put relationships first. Uh, in the words of Edgar Schein, who is probably, a, uh, most of you will know, he's been a, a sociologist in our world of human development for a very long time. Uh, he and his son are now working together and connection and belonging are the fundamental units of society. That was something Edgar said in the 19, I think the early 1960s. <laughs> uh, boy, it takes a long time for us to learn about these things. I, I know many of you here from my time when I was with you in April uh, that you're working with leaders. And, and I think now more than ever, leaders are realizing how much they're yearning for a, an experience that's not so filled with crises every single day. And um, yet we have workplace data that's telling us that incivility is at an all time high. I was just looking at some Gallup data. Engagement is down from uh, we were celebrating a 36% engagement in 21, but for the first half of 22, it's down to 29%. So I, I think we have, a, we have a tremendous opportunity as coaches and we have a road ahead of us with people feeling really out of sorts. So again, I'm gonna say this, take care of yourselves and be prepared to be with clients in a slightly different pacing. You know, to me, a coaching partnership, all coaching is about learning growth and change. And the partnership that we create with our clients is not our experience. It's our empathy and our compassion. It's our ability to be fully merged into the co-created field on their behalf, fully on their behalf, being curious to help them to notice and claim the habits and preferences and assumptions and biases that they're using to function in their lives and where it's not working for them. Unfortunately, the problem is our unconscious is going to try to protect us from seeing that it's time for a change. And yet there are things we can do as coaches, particularly evoking awareness skills, competency seven, that can help clients start to see the whole picture of their lives and to recognize that this moment they're experiencing, some situation, some context, some relationship, is simply that. It's a moment. It's not all of who they are. And of course, anything that prevents us from seeing the world as it is, is worthy of our attention. So I hope by now you have the slides that you've downloaded them so that if you're wanting to, um, to see them or print them and take notes, you can do that. And here we go. This is what we're up to tonight. So explore generative and healing conversations. Generative might be a new term to you. And if that's true, ask your question about that. What we'll be exploring is how do you detect the transmission of feelings with your clients? You're going to get a chance in uh, a couple of um, peer activities to explore this. And we're going to look at specifically the skills in evokes awareness, competency seven. What is the way you ask questions to help disrupt the status quo? It's also your presence that does that. In addition, it's your courage. It's your courage to challenge when you know your client is thinking about something that they clearly are strongly attached to and it's holding them in place of continuing to suffer. When we challenge them to look more deeply, it is initiating a generative process. So let's start here. 
I'd like you to use the chat. Here's the question. What do you know about mindset and how mindset is relevant to leading and coaching? Just take a few minutes to add your comments into chat. I'll put the question there as well. What do you know about mindsets? Helps if I can spell well. There you go. <laughs> How is it relevant to leading and coaching? <laughs> okay, Greta, it can affect everything I do. Okay. What else? Tend to see the world as you are. If you have a positive mindset, you'll see positive situations and vice versa. It's a lens through which we see and experience the world. It colors our world. It shapes our behaviors. It creates context and meaning. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. All right, so now let's look at this. What do you see here? So frame of reference and attitude, thoughts and beliefs, habits and routine actions. These are all influencing how we show up, how we make decisions, how we interact with others. Just think about the last couple of coaching sessions you had. Have you asked about your client's mindset? Or have you made assumptions by the way you are experiencing your client that they're in this frame of mind or they're, ex they're expressing this kind of attitude? Hi, I haven't heard him use that thought before. Our tendency is to do all that processing as if it's our responsibility. And the opportunity we're going to look at tonight is how do you allow it to stimulate uh, a much more spontaneous intervention on your part. Now, why am I saying that? Because it's our neurobiology that wires us toward habit. And it's also the same wiring that's our source for change. So the client is doing a microcosm of their lives. You've probably heard that phrase before. As you're noticing that there is a habit, you've seen it before with that client you have an opportunity to say, hmm, how familiar is that action you just described in your life right now? And how is that process that you just described serving what it is you say you want? What do we do in coaching to create an agreement at the beginning of a session? We say, what needs to be addressed or resolved for you to make progress? We don't really care about the outcome. <laughs> That's the client's responsibility. We care a lot about how are they relating to it. And until the client can notice what is the habit that has them stuck in the place they're in, not where they want to be, we can't begin to give them an opportunity through our co-creation in the session to see what else is possible. And of course, this is all applicable to you as well. So... You know, oftentimes I'll have leaders say to me, I'm just having a bad day. <laughs> and of course, the next question is, how do you know when you're having a good day? So that they can start to give some language to the, the full spectrum of what's possible. And what is the evaluation they're making that's moving them to good or bad, as opposed to I'm having a day? <laughs> I'm having an experience today and I'm realizing that some of my experience was created because I walked in with an attitude of X. So as you look at the slide here, um, you can under pressure overreact and have a bit of a screaming match, which is what the image looks like. But I've also had the opportunity to have a fender bender when both of us got out of the car pretty grounded and centered and had a bit of a chuckle about it, swapped our insurance information and went about our way. Same circumstance, but our mindset made a very big difference in the way that we show up. All right. So 
here's where um, I'm just defining generative so that we're all on the same page. We talked about this a little bit in August. So for those of you that were here, this is a, a repeat for you. But out of my coaching work, I began to recognize that there were some, there were some patterns when leaders started to step into their full whole expression and they were turning off the autopilot and stepping into a more deliberate way of showing up. The four capacities of generative are what you see in the outer rings, originate, create, learn, and produce. Most leaders are really darn good at producing or they wouldn't be a leader in their organization. And many of them who are good at producing results have the ability to create something tangible and convince other people that it ought to go to market. They're not usually not as good in learning, pausing to reflect what's really happening here, what motivated my choices, what was I paying attention to and what other people said, what was the basis of that I used to decide that that idea had merit or it needed to go back to the drawing board. That time for learning is skipped over and even worse, the learning that tells us what are we doing that has us be very effective get skipped over. Hmm. What happens to all of us when we don't stop to acknowledge something that's happened that we're proud of, that we're appreciating, that we have gratitude for? Pretty soon, we're exhausted. We're chasing the next revolving door, trying to figure out how to measure up. And it feels like scarcity will never be enough. I'll never catch up. I'll never do the right thing. And We've done it to ourselves partially, but it's also this uh, over reverence that we have in um, commercial life today. Actually, nonprofits are even worse at it to see what's left to be done rather than being able to continuously also take inventory about what's been accomplished. Without those two things being in balance, we do not have choice. We start to see ourselves being pulled and pushed from something external. And of course, how do we know that? Because we're not connected to ourselves, which is why the authentic self is sitting at the beginning, or sorry, at the center of the diagram. In order to live sovereign, this is the reason we want to be generative, so that we can freely express wherever we are, personal or professional context, it doesn't matter from what we know to be our unique core, what makes us, us. The words may sound the same between you, but your life history, your worldview, your experience, your sense of identity, these are all going to influence the way that you connect with and sustain your attention to an authentic self. So to what you were talking about, Michael, during your board meeting, this is what authenticity is about. Will you give yourself permission to be fully seen, to be fully appreciated for who you are and let go of the things that get in the way of us doing that, blinders and barriers. We're gonna talk about those a little bit. Now, this is a precondition. I'm gonna read this slowly for you. And again, think about some of your clients. I need to move my chat pod out of the way here. Hold on a second. As I read this, think about some of your clients and the degree to which this shows up with them. The range of what we think and do is limited by what we fail to notice. And because we fail to notice that we fail to notice, there is little we can do to change until we notice how failing to notice shapes our thoughts and deeds. This Scottish psychiatrist wrote that many decades ago. <laughs> but it's such an incredible truism. If we do not slow down with our clients and allow them to recognize where their autopilot switch is overriding what their heart and their body is telling them is no longer serving, the new choices they're going to make are going to come from the rearview mirror. Yes, Ava, so originate. Um, thank you, I did skip by it. Everything that's happened in humankind was made up. 
We're really good at it. Actually, lots of animals are too. Have you ever watched, a, a, I think they're called a, a, a gaggle of crows, um, particularly around like walnut trees or um, uh, fruit when it's bear, bearing on the trees. They are incredible at their ability to uh, pull it down, make sure they keep it away from the other birds. They almost play catch with it. They pick it up and they go to the next house and they drop it on the top and another crow picks it up and they move. So originate is about creating original ideas, new thoughts, ideation, imagination, um, tapping into spirit, allowing something to emerge into our mind's eye. And then with the breath, having it take color and texture and maybe sound and maybe sensation, standing at the edge of the water at the ocean. And you, you often hear people say, yeah, I went for a long walk on the beach and it was amazing. This idea came in, it's the thing I've been waiting, waiting for. I knew there was an answer and it just wasn't coming in my daily work. A, the capacity to originate is that quality of emergent thinking, ideation. <laughs> How many organizations allow for that today? Not many, unfortunately. But we do it in our coaching sessions with them, don't we? So why don't we do it all the time? The idea of plateau is something that um, I, I know I have had experiences over my now almost 30 years of doing this work where I felt on fire and enlivened and like, this is the best thing I could ever be doing. I still feel like I get to do my bliss every day. I don't, get, I don't have a job. It's extraordinary the privilege we have to work with people in the way that we do. And yet I've had my moments when I was bored or I started to notice that I was a little annoyed with clients. And I realized that I was burnt out and I hadn't noticed that little by little, I was losing my own connection to wholeness and therefore was not bringing it to the client. Now, some stages in my work, I realized when clients weren't doing their work that, uh-oh, it was me I needed to look in the mirror at. Other times it was a little more subtle where I was over giving to my clients and wearing myself out without making enough space for my own restoration process. And I'm giving you the metaphor here about the absence of light and water because in a tree, when the rings are really close together, that's a growing season when there wasn't enough water and there wasn't enough light for that tree to grow in its natural impulse. And if there's a thunderstorm and a lightning strike happens with a tree that doesn't have its full need of light and water, it will crack and often starts a fire and creates a ripple effect in the forest. So unconscious habits, the things that we do on autopilot are exactly what block the light to see. This is the reason we fail to notice because we've gotten attached to the habit, it's our preference, and our sense of duty or responsibility. Oh, this is going on in healthcare right now. So many clinicians have just overserved to the point where they can hardly recognize themselves. That sense of duty blocks the flow of water necessary to experience fully, to know when it's a moment to pause and to say, stop, take a break move away for a moment because you won't be fully available if you don't. So here's a moment for you individually. Hopefully you've got a piece of paper somewhere. I'd like you to just quietly for a few minutes, think about this question. What stops you each day from living fully potent, fully potent, all of your capacities? Now, I suspect what you've written down is what's come from your head, because we've been in our heads having a little bit of conversation and laying some foundation here. I'd like you to now 
uh, explore with your heart instead. So set your pen down. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. If not, just soften your eyes a little bit so that you can bring your attention into your body. And allow yourself to breathe really deeply, maybe even scanning from the top of your head down through your cavity of your chest, down your legs, all the way to your ankles, wiggle your toes a little bit. And just be quiet for the next 20 seconds or so. And let's see what your body has to say to you. What stops you each day to live fully potent? And opening your eyes, pick up your pen and write down the answer your body gave you. All right. And it's important to shift your state of attention. So you can either stand up or push your chair back. Or maybe just if you're in a one that turns, turn away from the screen for a minute. And again, closing your eyes, or at least softening them, bringing your attention internal. This time to the center of your chest. And imagine that as you breathe with each inhale, your heart is growing a little bit inside of your chest. And as you exhale, anything that's keeping it from growing, letting that go. And a second breath in the same way. On the inhale, allowing your heart to expand. And on the exhale, letting go of anything that feels constricted. Now ask your heart, what stops you each day to live fully potent? And when you're ready, pick up your pen and write that answer down. And please keep the piece of paper handy because you'll be working with it. All right, these are some clues to pay attention to in yourself and pay attention to with your clients. Some of the body clues are self-sacrificing choices, putting everybody else first, addiction of any kind, noticing that you quickly fatigue, and something that changes in your sleeping habits. You start to not feel rested when you get up. On the emotional levels, so we would say in the heart space, you notice that you have feelings of doubt more frequently than you have faith. Annoyance, one of my favorites. When that shows up, I know I am overworking prickly with others. They say things and you're wanting to react. Edgy, not feeling like you can get your center. Everything feels um, too intense, too, too something. 
and one I've seen an awful lot of in the last couple of years is feeling a wave of sadness that comes in and it's surprising. It doesn't seem to be congruent with the moment. And yet the sadness is there nonetheless. And headspace or mental cognition kinds of clues, obsessively reinventing. <laughs> I have a deal with our COO that when I want to do something with the curriculum, he has permission to say, hang on a second, does this really need to be done? <laughs> Fuzzy logic, like he just can't seem to solve the problem. The pieces just don't seem to fit together. And one is very common with teams in particular is stalled decision-making. Very difficult to make decisions when we're tired because we fail to notice that we're missing some important information, that we've stopped listening to our customers. We're not paying attention to what is occurring. We're, we're stuck and attached to something that is our preferred way of seeing the world. So this is a slide to have handy when you're working with your clients and just begin to notice and notice for yourself in your own reflection practice. This is a slide I'd like you to take a picture of, or if you've been able to print, this is a slide you'll want when you're in the breakout rooms. You know, these are some things that, um, that have shown up for me as I've worked these blinders and barriers with clients. Oftentimes I will hear them, if they're in um, body, a body state, that they're not noticing, it usually shows up with a really strong dualistic thinking. Everything is either right or wrong, good or bad. There is no gray available. If it's happening in their heart, there's a lot of judgment going on, making comparisons to other people, feeling competitive um, with colleagues or you know, maybe with other companies in the industry and they're, they're um, feeling a, a great deal of emotional pressure associated with that. And in the head, it's expert status. I have to know, I have to be top of my game. I can't, I can't say I don't know in a meeting. These are all indicators that we've stopped noticing. And we have something, something in our own uh, way of, seeing the world in our mindset. So frame of reference, thoughts, attitude, habits, choices, preferences, assumptions, biases. We're caught in a should of some kind, body, heart, head, sometimes they all come together. Barriers are more on the emotional side, but they still live in these three categories. Oftentimes we, we become more vigilant for risk we look at everything as either a source of more love or a source of loss. And we try to do our best to control the risk to make sure we get more love and less loss. But so much of what's happening right now is not in our control. We either suffer or we have the safety, but it doesn't feel satisfying. There's a temporary comfort in the familiar that goes very quickly to the feeling of isolation and boredom and suffering. And then in the right-hand corner, these are all acronyms. Of course, fear comes up. We're biologically predisposed to pay attention for things that will be dangerous for us. Um, you all know this as the limbic brain or the reticular activating system, the oldest part of the human body. We are animals after all. <laughs> Zig Ziglar said, um, he, he holds fear as false evidence appearing real. The other acronyms that often get operating when we're caught in a plateau is we have a fear of missing out, right? We are feeling that we might be not important enough. We might not get invited to the right meeting. So we're going to overwork again. And FOPO, feel of, uh, fear of other people's opinions. In all of these cases, we're separated from that authentic self. So you may have one or more of these operating and that would be perfectly normal, by the way, 
Plateaus are perfectly normal. It's what we do with them that matters. So here's what you'll be doing in the breakout rooms and you'll be working in pairs. I'd like you to start by sharing your name and your top personal value. So if you need a second or two with each other quietly to do that, that's fine. Think about what your top personal value is and share that after you've spoken your name. Whomever is going to be in the listening space for the first 10 minutes, please be the timer and do this, put, put it on 10 minutes. And you who are speaking, you're going to share your three answers to the question, what stops you each day to live fully potent? No explanation, simply share the answers. And then take a look at the table where I've just walked through the blinders and the barriers, the previous slide. And as you come to the end of your 10 minutes, pick one trait in each column, one mental blinder, one emotional barrier that you think is most influential in stopping you from living fully potent. Thank your partner and then switch and repeat the steps. All right, any questions before Michael sends you off into your rooms? Janet, I have a question for you. We had sure. one person drop out. So uh -huh. would you like to join that person in their room? I'm putting you on the spot or how <laughs> to do I'm it? happy to do it or you can go and I can hang. I can't, I can't figure out how to get myself in there. So <laughs> that's all. Well, why don't you have one person stay in the main room? Okay, I will do okay. that. And I'm going to pause the recording now. So it gives this a... <sighs> so take a nice deep breath for yourself. And on the inhale, breathe in that experience you've just had. And then let yourself exhale and release it so we can come back to being in our full collective together. And we'll have some open time here to uh, just hear, you know, what your experience was. I wanted to give a little bit of context to it here. Um, when you start to think about uh, plateaus, it, first of all, they're natural, they're normal. This is mostly uh, what I was offering you with looking at light and water for a tree. It's a cycle. They get shorter, right? The, the troughs and the mountains we climb um, start to soften a little bit. But in some ways, it's our, it's our own psyche's way of giving us a map of our growth and development over time. Said in generative terms, the deconstruction process is learning. This is really what you've just done in the, in the activity is to kind of deconstruct what, what does full potency mean to you? What are the different ways in which you experience it, body, heart, and mind? And then we can construct something new, something new to change and shift our experience. Hopefully what happened is you were looking at some of the clues of what brings blinders and barriers forward, you started to see, oh, I have a mental model or I have a way of um, preferring my life to go, that there was a way you originated your relationship to being a coach or whatever your professional endeavor is. And I've created a way of relating in the world. Hmm, it's not always working for me. Or maybe it is, maybe you're in a moment when you're not in plateau and to start to recognize, huh, how did I get here? How do I pay attention differently to notice when I might be wanting some time for a bit more restoration? So again, this is our cycles and they're never a habit, just like awareness. Our ability to sustain being generative and using all of those capacities is a practice every single day. So with that backdrop, I just open the floor and open up your mics. We're sitting in a living room, no, no big deal. 
Um, anybody that wants to share or comment or ask a question, uh, now's the time. Okay, I'll, I'll start. This is Ellen. I uh, can't hold back. I just want to share that. Uh, and where is she there? I've not seen her, Gail. Um, our discussion, there she is. Mm -hmm. She is so lively, all coach, all time lived a lot has lived and still living and uh so strongly and that she's taking risks because she's lived and she's like why not and so I love the inspiration she had of living a potent life and I could just feel it of what that looked like so I'm thankful for having her share some of her strategies that she does in her sessions and um she shared you know i different than i would have i take more risks i try new things all the time to keep it and i'll use my word fresh to keep it fresh some things work some things don't i learned from it and i just thought it was so authentic it was fabulous beautiful really good example of softening the grip right yeah you want to say something about that gail you're on mute. Um, yeah. Oh, Alan, I wanted to thank you too for, for the sharing that you did and your journey. And I was on that journey. And I really recognized that when I was on that journey, I was in exactly the same place that you were thinking about all of those things and doing all those things. Um, and, you know, I was a single parent and I had two children and there was just lots of things going on at the same time. And I don't have that situation now and so it's a, it sort of has freed me up to I guess I think I was sharing with Ellen I don't need to do this but I absolutely love it and I don't think I shared with you Ellen but there was a time during COVID that I thought I wouldn't do it again and then I started doing it again and thought oh, oh no no I just want to do it I just want to continue to do it so so and thank you for sharing Ellen. Fabulous. Thank you both. Who else? Well, I can tell on myself. Um, what I noticed is I, sh I thought I was following the instructions very well. And uh, Lori and I were having an exchange. And I was finding my energy was kind of low. And yet I didn't stop in and say, okay, what's going on? How are you losing your see in this very moment? And gratefully, Lori just burst through all of any barriers she had and was just vital and vibrant and sharing um, how she feels so called to what she's doing right now. So it was perfect reflection of how I can get stuck in being right, wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And you know what's so tricky about it, Sandra, thanks for your vulnerability here, um, is that everything that we give to our lives is to be of service. It is to create connection and belonging. That's in our human DNA. It is to um, feel that sense of satisfaction when we've, we've used our faculties well. And sometimes we don't. <laughs> and rather than getting upset with ourselves for that, if we can notice it and realize, ah, where might I attend to myself differently? 
Where might I have left myself out of the equation? Where might I have interpreted something and I've been carrying it around, not even realizing that it's running me? Like, did I really hear the instructions? <laughs> right? And, and starting at the very beginning and going, I have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> Would you please tell me, right? Yeah. Um, it, I, I just feel so strongly that we must learn to say, I don't know, and celebrate when people say, I don't know. Like, thank goodness. Yeah. Well, what's the deal about trying to be an expert or have it just right, right? Because yeah. in the instant that we think we figured it out, it's no longer there. How many of you have read Stephen Covey's book, um, Trust and Inspire? Anybody pick that up yet? Yeah. So there's this little throwaway line in there that just stopped me dead in my tracks. Evidently, somebody's been researching how quickly human knowledge doubles. In 1982, they calculated it at 13 years. Anybody want to guess what it is now in 2021? 12 hours. Wow. <laughs> wow. So that essentially says anything we think we know is epically out of date by the time we've slept overnight. <laughs> And so what replaces it, right? What is it? it I, I think this is some, you know, world according to Janet, coaching came on the scene when it did because we're giving people a roadmap that is the alternative to needing to be right, to needing to be an expert, to needing to always have answers, to always being the fixer, to something that is much more collaborative, a more collective approach that says, we each see a piece of the picture. If we can put all of the pictures on the wall and put them together, we're gonna to see a different system than any one of us can see alone. This is what's called a social mindset, being able to make decisions by collecting information that looks at the impact on society as a whole, not just our individual experience. So the plateaued Sandra gives you an opportunity to go, huh? If I stop this pattern that I have, this noticing I just had, what opens up for me? So we see plateau is the, this signal, the, you know, it's the wave of the hand that says, hey, over here, <laughs> as opposed to something that we take as a weakness or a deficit in some way, which is often how it's been um, held. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Not used to you guys being so shy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I thought I'd give you a, a few uh, tactics, methods, ways to play with this for yourself. And um, what I'm really talking about here is replacing, generalizing with personalizing. Each of you will have your own way. The folks that have shared have talked a little bit about being in a time in your life when you're feeling very enlivened. You're not in plateau. There was a time when you weren't totally enlivened. So it's in your DNA. As I said, it's a natural cycle. So one of the things that's very useful is to have some practice where you can face your patterns of being and relating with a beginner's mind, just like Sandra modeled. Um, some of my favorites are, um, I love to take things into meditation. Who was I yesterday? How fully did I allow myself to express yesterday? I, I do a word every year. And the one that I, I'm working with, I, I turn the word into an acronym. So the one I'm working with this year is um, voice. And V is vitality prioritized. Um, o is opening to what's emergent. I is initiating loving intention. C is center in grace. And E is express courageously. So I'll take voice into meditation and let's do a bit of an inventory for myself. How well did I honor my intention yesterday? And if I didn't, what, what was it that got my attention instead that might be saying something that I want to be attending to or a way that I'm holding 
myself to account that isn't actually serving me. I, I'm missing something that's going on right around me, right here in front of me. And the only way I can figure that out is if I'm noticing what I'm failing to notice. Questioning the source of our patterns, working with a peer, being able to um, narrate our stories and begin to express to each other, ah, this is what was motivating me. And of course, starting to experiment a little bit with suspending the patterns. Let me, let me try taking a risk as Gail was talking about. Um, maybe there isn't so much loss out there. Maybe there's more opportunity if I take a risk and soften my grip a bit. And of course, when we're experimenting, not trying to do this from the rear view mirror from our wonderful filing cabinet full of experiences and uh, things we know work, because they might not work now, not in the new environment, not in the change that's dynamically occurring all the time, but from insight, trusting more of our sensing, what's happening in the body, what's happening emotionally, what am I feeling in response to the people and places and things I'm engaged with, and allowing that to do something that uh, is a bit more spontaneous, not quite so calculated, and and then with reflection, being able to examine, hmm, I'm still okay. I'm still here. I still have my sense of humor. I still have my sense of self. Huh, I wonder what would happen if I brought that in. So in competency two, for example, we talk about how important it is to have a reflection practice. Um, reflection on what? On your experimenting, on your sense of what is the experience that you've had and to exercise with deep honesty about it, knowing that there's always more than what's happening right now, that every moment of our lives is a snapshot, but we live in full color, full technicolor in a movie. Every breath we take, there's always another option for choice. And I think sometimes we can get caught up in wanting to mm, present uh, ourselves in a way that other people um, receive us and we feel that sense of belonging by the way we present when the real belonging is with ourselves. And then there's nothing that we need to present. There's only the beingness of who we are. And so that's all I really had for you this evening. And uh, I do have a, there's some other slides in the deck uh, there's some information about other work that we do at Invite Change. There's a wonderful YouTube channel. If you're not readers of choice, you do get a 25% discount on it. Invite Change is the code. Again, it's on the slides. I did just release a TED Talk. And, uh, and I'm, I'm very passionate about the conflation that we see between being judgmental and judgment. And I think that we've made judgment, the exercise of judgment, discernment, critical thinking, an enemy. We have clouded our understanding of it. And it's left people um, staying with those who are like-minded rather than being willing to be disturbed and to see beyond what's familiar to them, to recognize, oh, there's something else going on here. And if we don't stop saying suspend judgment and be non-judgmental, we're going to have a tough time solving the big problems in the world. We need everybody's judgment and we need people to feel worthy to offer their point of view and perspective. So that's what's on the TED Talk. And the floor is open, Michael, to you. Yeah, well, let's do this. Um, Janet, I know you're happy to take questions. So um, what, are some, uh, what are some questions you might have? Anything that's kind of rising up to the top that you'd like to ask Janet? You guys can come off mute. We like the noise in the background and the dogs barking and all of that. So that is not a problem. The best part of COVID is that we we can human. <laughs> it is. Yeah, really wonderful. So any questions? So I have a question for you then, because I'm a coach, right? So here's what I would like to ask. As we were listening to, sometimes we'll hear gems or 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 things that show up for us uh, as we're listening to our presenter and, and Jen is with us. So here's a question. What 
seems to be the most significant thing that you heard or felt or experienced in the time as Janet shared? What seems to be significant to you? I think just reflecting, uh, this is Ellen, uh, just reflecting on, am I being potent? A am I bringing everything to the table every day? And um, that was a great reflection. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a great exercise and and saw where I could feel. And I also, it was really transformational when we went from the first thought when she said, you know, what's stopping you from being potent? Explore with your head. I'm like, you know, I seem to get tired every day. I mean, there's a point where I, I, I go, I'm tired. And I don't remember being tired. But then when I really thought from a heart and she said, breathe deeply, um, there's a little bit part of me that I'm afraid to go change it, like change it up because there's some something about being comfortable in that's just the way it is. And so I think there's something there. And so, I mean, I, I literally, when she said breathe deeply, I just said, I'm afraid. And then, um, and then I asked myself from what, and I said to start and which is way different than I'm tired. Good noticing Ellen. That's right. Thank you. You know that, uh, the generative listening we can do to just go back again, get just a little quieter, get a little stiller and patiently wait, the body and the heart will always answer. Always answer. Janice asked a question about how do you deal with expert status blinder? Um, I, I think this was uh, one that I worked in financial services for a long time um, and, and actually started coaching there and then went out on my own. And boy, are there a lot of experts in financial services, um, <laughs> myself included. And I think that... Uh, the way I work with clients who are um, very identified with expert status is to lean in and say, yeah, that's right. And that's hard to one. And what are you leaving on the table? How do people be with you when you have all the answers? What would happen if you took all of your answers and turned them into questions? Oh, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do, because you've been asking questions to collect information to become an expert. You absolutely know how to ask questions. But the difference is you're asking to learn about your people rather than the world of ideas and process and method. Because of course, what are we doing? We're restoring the balance in relationships with productivity inside of organizations. And uh, I have a very firm belief in making people right for exactly where they are. <laughs> and helping them to see the bigger picture. You live in a system, there's so much more here. And to Ellen's point, make it safer for them to trust themselves to start. They don't have to give up anything about their expert status, but there's a whole bunch more in their toolbox that they're not picking up and weaving into their daily experience. That's what we make emergent for them. And you can never predict it. <laughs> We can only ask about it, which is why I've given you that table to, to experiment a little bit with the way in which you're interviewing yourself and get comfortable with that in your own reflection practice and then apply it with clients. Thanks for the question, Janice. Did that address what you were asking? Cool. I'll, uh, I'll jump out, Michael, with your, your question and I think uh, one of the things that that touched my heart tonight, Janet, was the uh, the metaphor of the tree and the fact that, you know, when 
there isn't when our need, you know, the roots of our tree don't get the nutrients and the water and the light that we need, you know, our, our tree doesn't shine in its most productive self. And I, and I think about um, that metaphor from the perspective of trying to help myself and then others uncover our needs as opposed to kind of what we like to show as that healthy tree with fruit and flowers and the whole bit. And I, I appreciated that metaphor. And I guess my my question, uh, particularly when it comes to judgment, I, I love that um, you've done a, a TED talk on that. I'll go look for that now. But uh, the this idea of, you know, using that metaphor, even to judge ourselves and recognizing that those needs are not being met and you know how do we tie in judgment of ourselves because of what we show and then judgment of others because of what we see but those roots are actually hidden right and so there's just uh, some just a whole interesting discussion around that and I just would love your thoughts and if any any of that kind of sparks any other additional ideas <sighs> One of the ways that I think about this, um, Cynthia, is what what's the purpose of our autopilot? So I've done a little bit of neuroscience research enough to realize that I could never learn everything there is to know about neuroscience. Oh my goodness. However, it's really clear to me that our mechanism, the reticular activating system that establishes all the filters that construct our personality serve the purpose of providing a platform through which to be productive, effective, safe, um, find our way in the world. Uh, it's our invisible rubric for relationships uh, that will provide what we need emotionally for our connection and belonging instinct, which is in our DNA, as well as our ability to uh, find reciprocity for effort. There's something in exchange and on we go. So I think our bodies are kind of predis predisposed to autopilot until it doesn't work. And then we take it personally, <laughs> right? And most human beings, uh, Although I heard this horrible statistic the other day, 9% of the CEOs are considered conscious, which means 91% are not, and tending towards narcissism. I just can't believe that it's that small a number. <laughs> Something in me is just not willing to accept that data. But it's interesting, even if it's off by 50%, it's still too many. So what is it in our environment, our social or sociology environments, right? That we have revered repeatability, predictability, mm -hmm. and sustaining the status quo as the higher priority than the innate instinct to creativity, which by definition means change, which by definition means disruption, which by definition means discomfort. So we can't say, I don't know. We can't, we can't sit in the suffering of, ooh, I don't know how to be a learner here. I think these are frontiers for us as coaches to restore um, the capacity internally for our clients to navigate life with spontaneity being a, a higher value for us than our certainty. And it's a mind game, of course, right? So it, it's a mindset shift, which I actually think is probably one of our most underdeveloped capabilities as human beings. We don't, we don't spend enough time even with kids to help them recognize, you know, you just had a meltdown. Okay, you've gotten quiet. We've turned down all the noise. You've started to look me in the eye again and you're giggling. I have five grandchildren. <laughs> You know, and, and all of the sudden, because I'm present in that stillness, they say, well, grandma, what about, and they're back in their life again. So that's mindset shift. We're teaching that by the presence we have with them. What is every employee asking for? The reason those engagement numbers are so down, how do I have engagement again? How do I connect? I don't know how to do it in a hybrid world. 
My boss doesn't know how to do it in a hybrid world. Where's the rule book? How do I figure this out? Well, we figure it out together. <laughs> and we that we can is what we don't connect to. Right? I could probably talk on that for quite a while, so I'll stop. <laughs> I have a request, actually. I put the um, the link to the YouTube, or sorry, the TEDx, and the um, I learned something. I'm going to pass along a little inside story about YouTube. They have three criteria in their algorithm. Algorithm. Does anybody else know this data? Oh, okay, Lori, you're going to love this as a social media person. Relevance, quality engagement. Relevance is measured by whether or not somebody watches the video all the way through. My ask is that you do that. It's 10 minutes and 19 seconds. <laughs> Quality is like or dislike. Do you press the thumbs up? Engagement, do you leave a comment? That's the minimum for them to show your video to somebody else's feed. And they TEDx um, processes and they put their own meta tags in. They watch it and decide what those things are. And then they show those to other people. If you do one more thing, step four is share it. That raises the rating on relevance and on engagement. So those of you that aspire to do anything on YouTube, <laughs> anything on YouTube, right? Um, or TEDx or anything like that. But those are the things to keep in mind, relevance, engagement, and quality. <laughs> I think there were a few, it looked like some people came on to possibly share or a thought or a question, but is there anything of significant, like what seems significant to you or any questions you might have? Since we do have a little bit of time. Yes, I'd like to. Um, Janet, thank you so much. What really impacted me is when coaching came on the scene. Mm. And I got this wonderful awareness of um, being a coach is at the essence, a change agent. Because my support of my clients is to go against the autopilot of certainty and polarity and all, all that we're suffering with now. And it's like, how wonderful. It's like, of course I wanna be a coach because I wanna disrupt the old paradigms that are so hurtful. So that just was wonderful for you to say, why do you think coaching came on the scene when it did? So really appreciate that, thank oh, you. Oh, good. It's always such a joy to see you, Sheila. And you know, you're modeling having that social mindset. When, when we coaches can think systemically and listen to our clients through the lens of, are they thinking about the impact on their community, on society, on their industry, as they're working their way through this decision? And what question could I ask them to help them open up their camera lens a little bigger and to recognize, yeah, the world is complex, but you're not gonna solve it singularly, <laughs> right? Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gail and Lori. So maybe you all just want some networking time and I will excuse myself to go make some dinner. Always wonderful to be with you and I wish you well and keep loving your life's work. Thank you, Janet. Thank you so much for being with us. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. So excellent. So thank you all for being here. I did want to give extra space. Um, Janet sort of warned us. She said this topic, sometimes uh, we need a little time to just sort of process all that information. So that was part of the reason I, I took it so slow with the questions there just to share with you, just to give some space. It's not always, uh, not, not so much an assignment, but just space to, to think and hear from one another. Um, there are a few things uh, that, um, that I would love to, to share with each of you as, as we're wrapping things up here. Um, we have a wonderful opportunity uh, next Thursday. Uh, one of our board members, Camber Hill, he started this year uh, a monthly program called Coaches Connection. We've used it for a number of different things. 
but we're really getting back to Canva's uh, heart and vision for it, which is really to just ask a question and have a conversation coach to coach. So the question and Canva, if nothing else, he does like to provoke and open up things with great questions. And if he was here, he'd laugh very loudly at me when I say that. Um, but the question is a phenomenal question. And uh, the question that he's going to dive into with those of you who attend is, what are your insecurities? And just to have a coach to coach conversation about that, where we don't have to show up with um, the way of being that we think people will be impressed or that we have it all together, but just to be able to have that conversation. So if you want a deeper description of that, of course, you can go on our website. There's a little bit more of a description, also an opportunity to, to register for that op, you know, time. It's usually a smaller group of people, so it's a lot more conversational. And that'll be from 12 to 1 on June 23rd, which is a Thursday. The other thing I just want to let you all know is um, July, we typically will take a month. Uh, last year, it was August. This year, it's July. And we will uh, not be hosting any events for the month. However, we will be coming back gangbusters in August for the remainder of the year. So July will be a quiet month. Um, but in August, we will... our chapter meeting, which will be a little difficult, but I'm giving you a head start. If you don't live in Orange County or Southern California, you may have to book a flight, but we're going to uh, to do um, a, a, a mixer at the beach. So we're going to be able to get out there with our beach chair and our flip-flops and enjoy some food together and just enjoy the beach. Um, there has been a strong request for s'mores, so I am uh, bringing along an additional fire pit in case we can't get one. Uh, for, from my you know camping expeditions and so we will have that there as well just a, just a, an evening to really connect and um and to just um you know just connect with others and and have a conversation and and there is no big heavy program the only thing we might do is welcome everyone and then share some things that are upcoming and that's about it that's the biggest part of the program otherwise we're just going to enjoy great food and enjoy time together uh, in the sand, which uh, that is the beauty of Southern California, right? That that's why so many of us um, live here and, uh, and all are invited to that. Uh, there's also uh, some other things in the works for August. So we'd love you to just kind of stay aware and, and be paying attention as things are coming out. Uh, we will have uh, probably some conversations around the topic of um, uh, DEI um, and, and have some experts uh, come and share with us uh, through the lens of how that impacts coaching. And that will be um, uh, two Tuesdays in August as well as uh, the first uh, Tuesday of September. So that'll be uh, part of the, the plan unfolding here in the next few weeks. Um, the survey, I just wanted to share. I said there'll be a survey and then CEUs and all of that. Um, the I'm going to stop recording. No one needs to hear me say this. Sorry. Um, 